And now, preview time. When it comes to entertainment, you can't beat a good film. So let's take a look at what's coming your way. Welcome back, one and all. It's that glorious time of year where my hair is just too short for like a whole month. I... I grow it out till I can't handle it anymore, and then it gets cut too short. Every time. Every time they cut it too short. And I just, I just gotta wait for it to grow back to the length I like. Welcome back to Matt's Movie Nights. My hair's too short. I'm upset about it. Last time, I did an Easter triple feature, which I think is, this is the first time I've done anything for Easter on this channel. Uh, I have, I've thought about reviewing the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments for Easter. I've just never found the time. I, it's, if I did that, it'd have to be a two-parter. It would have to be a two-parter. And <laughs> I've promised myself I won't do another two-parter. But if I reviewed that movie, it would have to be. It's three fucking hours. No, four fucking hours. But I do have a lot to say about Ten Commandments. It's, uh... It's definitely a movie worth talking about, but not today. Today we're going to talk about my very funny Easter triple feature. Um, the, 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 the joke explained, the joke here is that in Donnie Darko, he goes to see a double feature of Last Temptation of Christ and Evil Dead. Um, Last Temptation of Christ is an Easter movie, because it's about Jesus. And Donnie Darko is an Easter movie because it's about a rabbit, even though it takes place in October. Don't, don't question me. So starting with Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ, our, our first Martin Scorsese film, and probably the only Martin Scorsese film I will ever show on movie nights, because this breaks one of my two rules. I won't... For, for movie nights, no movies over two hours. I showed Caligula, and it was excruciating, and I'm like, nope, I gotta, I, they, they all need to be under two hours from now on. I bent the rules for Last Temptation of Christ. I will probably not do that again. I mean, there are movies I might bend that rule for, but I kind of doubt there will be another Martin Scorsese movie. <laughs> Weirdly, I feel like so often I have to, like, justify why I like sort of religious movies to non-believers. Like, uh, another Martin Scorsese film, Silence. Great movie. One of the best religious movies ever made. I love Silence. Um, also, the writer of this movie... Shit, who wrote this movie? Paul Schrader. Paul Schrader made a movie, uh, First Reformed, just like a year or two ago. I say a year or two, I forgot about 2020. Two or three years ago. I forget if it was 2018 or 2019. But uh, First Reformed, it's a religious movie, but it's really good. Like, these are movies you can enjoy whether you are a Christian or not. It's, you need to acknowledge the craft, the filmmaking that went into these. But on the flip side, Last Temptation of Christ is a film I feel I have to justify to Christians. Because a lot of Christians don't like this movie. And a lot of Christians haven't seen this movie. So they don't even know why they don't like this movie. Last Temptation of Christ is based on a book. And I forget who wrote the book. Maybe it says... Nikos Kazantzatskis? I probably butchered that. I should have just pretended I didn't know who wrote this. It's based on a book, and not the Gospels. It's, it's a fictionalized retelling of the story of Jesus. It admits as much in the intro of the movie. The, the thing I think Christians would probably object to most is, in this film... Uh, Jesus is just a man who has the role of Messiah bestowed upon him. He is not divinely born. He is he's a normal man, and God chooses him to be the Messiah. 
and I, I, that goes against what is typically considered biblical canon. Although, there were a lot of people in, like, the early, early Christian church who believed that. That was not an uncommon belief un among early, early Christians. About the time the Catholics formed, whatever the Catholics believed kind of became, like, here's what's canon, and stuff like Jesus just had the role of Messiah bestowed upon him stopped being very popular with people, so I could see Christians sort of objecting to that. Uh, God damn, that's a loud truck. Fuck me. We're gonna, I'm gonna spy on Matt. Is he filming? Is he filming yet? Oh, he's filming. Quick, let's bring out the giant trucks and go over all the speed bumps and make all the beeps and bloops. Also, this film got titties in it, so don't show this one in youth group. It's got titties in it. Those are the two things I could see Christians objecting to in this movie. But it seems like what pissed most people off is that uh, about mm, a little past the halfway mark of the film, you know, Jesus is being crucified, and then, like, an angel speaks to him, and he comes down off the cross, and he, he lives the rest of his life like a normal man. He, he marries Mary Magdalene, he has children, he has, you know, this, this nice life, he doesn't have to get crucified, and I think a lot of Christians got really upset at that, without watching to the end of the movie. Because at the end of the movie, this is massive spoilers, by the way. If you haven't seen Last Temptation of Christ, please watch Last Temptation of Christ. I am about to spoil the ever-loving shit out of it. At the end of the movie, it's, it shows him... He, he, he has this, like, nice life, and he decides... Instead of having this nice life, he's going to die on the cross. That's, that's how the movie ends. He, he realizes, like, I could have this, or I could die for humanity's sins, and he decides to die for everyone's sins anyways. Which, you know, ties into the title of the movie. It is Christ's Last Temptation. He is tempted to come off the cross and live a normal life, and he chooses not to, which I think is a very Christian message for this film to have. That That's the part Christians seem to have a problem with, not the stuff about, like, him not being the Messiah or the titties. That's the thing everyone's like, oh, Jesus has to die on the cross. You can't make a movie about Jesus not dying. It's like, that's not, that's not what this movie is. That's not what this movie is. Yeah, it's a good movie. It's a really good movie. Um, like, like really good performances all around. Um, uh, Willem Dafoe as Jesus, of course. This is, this is early Willem Dafoe. He was not a big star at this point. But he's really good as Jesus. And then H Harvey Keitel as Judas is kind of odd because he's, he's sort of got the New York accent. And <laughs> he even says like, A in the movie at one point. So something like that. He says something very New Yorker in this movie. And for some reason they decided to make him a ginger. And I'm like, these are Jews living in the Middle East. None of them are gingers. <laughs> That's wrong. Don't do that. And Harvey Keitel's not a ginger. So why did they change? They, they had to give him a wig to make him. Why would you do that? You're making it less accurate. There's a lot of people, a lot of like really famous people in just like really minor roles. I mean, it's about Jesus. Jesus is the main character. And it, the only other two characters that really do much besides Jesus are uh, Judas and Mary Magdalene. Um, but apart from those two, 
most characters have like one or two scenes tops. But there's still some really great actors in there. Uh, Harry Dean Stanton plays uh, the Apostle Paul. Um, David Bowie plays Pontius Pilate, which is choice casting. I love that. I love David Bowie as Pontius Pilate. It's yeah, just, just a really good cast, really good cinematography, really odd story. It's a very... It's a very surreal story. It feels like it reminds me of a an Alejandro Jodorowsky film, and in it's very strange and very spiritual. Um, it's perhaps not as surreal as a as a Jodorowsky film, but it's it's a very spiritual movie. I mean, it's the story of Jesus Christ. It's kind of gotta be a spiritual movie, but <laughs> you know, it's it's this odd movie that tries to make Jesus a sympathetic character? If that <laughs> makes sense? I don't know. It's my favorite interpretation of the Jesus story for sure. Better than Passion. Definitely better than Passion. It's, it's a very interesting movie for sure. It's a very interesting movie and I, I would encourage Christians, even if you end up going like, yeah, that was sort of blasphemous. Even even if you decide it was sort of blasphemous, I highly encourage you to at least look at it. Because there's a, a lot this movie has to say. And of, of course, to non-believers as well, if you don't believe in Jesus, absolutely, this is a great movie. Please, please watch this movie. I think non-believers will probably get more out of it than believers, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong about that. Last Temptation of Christ, it's it's brilliant. I love it. I, I really would like to listen to the audio commentary for this one because I, I kinda wanna know what like Scorsese and them have to say about like the controversy around the film. I haven't really looked into that. I I don't know what how Scorsese and them responded. Um you know, Martin Scorsese, Willem Dafoe, and Paul Schrader all on the audio commentary. So I would like to check that out, because I want to know how they responded to the controversy. Last Temptation of Christ. Controversial film. Great film. Highly recommended. Very out of character for for Matt's movie nights. I like showing fun, fast-paced genre films, and this is none of those things. <laughs> I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's not fun to watch. I... I might actually say this is a fun movie, but it's not fast-paced, and it's not a genre movie. <laughs> then we watched one of my favorite movies, Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead, from 1981. I think... I think they made it in 81, and then it didn't get, like, major distribution until 83. That's my understanding. Cause this was a very small, very low budget project, and it's it's sort of weird to think of Evil Dead in those terms. I'm wearing my uh, sick new Video Nasties T-shirt. Um, the Evil Dead was one of the Video Nasties, and it kind of feels out of place because so many of the Video Nasties are just like these obscure indie movies that were made for like no money, and then you go wait. Evil Dead was an obscure indie movie that was made for not much money. It's weird to think about now because there's so much Evil Dead merchandise. There's, you know, two sequels, a remake, and a spinoff show. And a, they're apparently working on another Evil Dead. Um, also, Bruce Campbell leaked that Ash might have a cameo in Doctor Strange, but I think that was an April Fool's joke. I don't think that's actually happening. But it's, uh, uh, I hope it's true. I hope it's not an April Fool's joke. I want Ash to have a cameo in the next Doctor Strange movie. Evil Dead, the quintessential story of teenagers going to a cabin in the woods and they find the Necronomicon, the Book of the Dead, and they resurrect this evil spirit 
And it, it starts inhabiting them, and they have to, like, fight it. And the, the only way to, like, get rid of it is to, like, kill someone who's been possessed and, like, chop up their body and bury them and and put a cross over their grave. And that's, that's even assuming you can defeat this thing, because it kind of seems like you can't. Because Ash deals with it for three fucking movies, and then they made a TV series about it. Um, Sam Raimi's directorial debut, um, he would of course go on to direct the original Spider-Man movies. <laughs> um, great director, great director. He's got a really good visual style. I love Sam Raimi. I, lo I love Sam Raimi's sense of style. And it's, you can definitely see it in this film. It's a great little, it's, it's got tons of great shots in it. I know it's, it's kind of silly. It's kind of cheesy. There's definitely stuff about it that is not amazing, that is not great. But the cinematography is amazing. Sam Raimi knows how to shoot and edit a film. Um, I still think one of the Coens edited this. Ethan Cohen, I think? Ethan Cohen was like one of the editors on Evil Dead, on the original Evil Dead, and that's how he got his start in the industry. That's how the Coens got their start in the industry. So... Yeah, we, we have the Evil Dead to thank for Sam Raimi and the Coen brothers. And Bruce Campbell. Can't forget Bruce Campbell. Although, <laughs> he's admittedly not very good in this movie. <laughs> He's better than a couple of the other actors, but he, he... I don't know, like Ash... What is that sound? Probably just wind. Like, Ash... In, like, Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness, Ash, Ash is this kind of crazy, like... Ooh, a super badass action hero. And it's kind of a joke, like, he, he tries to be the badass action hero and it, like, comes back and kicks him in the face. But in this, he's, like, such a tame, soft-spoken person. He, he doesn't really do much in terms of action. He, fight, he fights the, uh, the Deadites, obviously, but, like... Everyone, he has to. Like, he, he's required to do that. Odd start for a character and an actor who would go on to be much, much cooler than this. It's super fun. It's super bloody. My god, there's so much blood in this movie, and I love it. I love it. It's like... I would barely even describe it as gory, because it's all just blood. And it's such an excessive amount of blood that she'd be like, it's it's not a it's not realistic, you know. Someone gets stabbed and it's like blood, blood everywhere. It's just paint the fucking walls from the tiniest cut. You know what this made me think of? Cause Daddy Derek just finished Cool Cat Stops Coronavirus way back when he was planning on making a uh, Cool Cat versus the Wicked Witch. And I wrote a parody script of Cool Cat vs. the Wicked Witch that was just an Evil Dead parody. It was Cool Cat Does Evil Dead. I need to dig that script up, because I'm pretty sure I was finished, or, or at least close to being finished. I should see about releasing that, about, about, about doing something with that script. Evil Dead, it's, it's fun, it's so much fun, it's so enjoyable, it's really well made, considering the context it was made under. Um, it, it gave rise to a lot of big people in Hollywood. It's, it's both a really fun and entertaining movie and a fairly important movie. And now that I've shown it, I can show Evil Dead 2 whenever I want. And Evil Dead 2 is a much, much better film. Like, I, I, I love Evil Dead to bits. It's amazing, it's great, and I love it. Evil Dead 2 is better. It's, it's not even a competition. Evil Dead, please watch it. I love it. <laughs> I, honestly, 
I would recommend Evil Dead over Last Temptation of Christ. I think Evil Dead's a better movie. I love Last Temptation of Christ too, but you know, you can't compete with Evil Dead unless you're Evil Dead 2. Finally, we watched Donnie Darko uh, because he goes to see a double feature of Evil Dead and Last Temptation of Christ. Um, I kind of... They show clips from Evil Dead in this movie. Like, he's in the theater and they show the screen and he's watching Evil Dead. It is Evil Dead. But I feel like they meant to put Evil Dead 2 because this takes place in 1988. And Last Temptation of Christ was 1988 and Evil Dead 2 was 1987. So it makes sense that both of those would still be in theaters when this movie takes place. It's kind of weird that they're showing Evil Dead in 1988. But whatever, I, I think Richard Kelly had a point with that. I think it's funny. I think it's a really good joke that he sees a double feature of those two movies. And I, I do think uh, Last Temptation of Christ does tie in to Donnie Darko. There is definitely a connection you could make between those two. Donnie Darko, the story of Donnie Darko, a boy who suffers mental disorder. Um, I think kind of schizophrenia. It seems like maybe he has schizophrenia. But um, he starts seeing this rabbit named Frank who's trying to, like, warn him about something. And, like, the, the first time he sees Frank, it, Frank tells him to, like, get out of the house. So he gets out of the house, and as soon as he does, a, a jet engine from an airplane crashes into his room. And it would have killed him if he hadn't left the house. And so the whole story is kind of him trying to figure out why Frank's there, what Frank's talking about, what he's supposed to do next. Um, so he starts studying up on time travel, and he starts to have sort of psychic premonitions, sort of, kind of. And, you know, he's reading up on time travel... And all, all these things he's doing, and, and amongst all this, there's a new girl at school, and the new girl clearly has a crush on Donnie. Put a pin in that, actually. This is a scene I want to talk about. I just flat forgot to talk about the scene I wanted to talk about. When the girl shows up, uh, Drew Barrymore, who's their teacher, Drew Barrymore is like, Ooh, sit next to the boy you think is the cutest. You cannot fucking do that. Like, I'm I'm almost certain there's some rule against teachers doing that. But if there isn't, there should be. Because, Jesus Christ, you cannot do that shit to me. Do not. Do not. She has a crush on Donnie, and she and Donnie start dating. But then things go wrong, and she ends up dead. And... He realizes that the jet engine is from an airplane that hasn't that hadn't taken off yet when it crashed into his room. It like got caught in a wormhole and went back to his room. And then he time travels back and dies in his room because he realizes that, that would stop his girlfriend from having to die. So in order for her to stay alive, he goes back in time and dies when he was supposed to die. So in that case, you know, you see the comparison The Last Temptation of Christ. Like, Last, Tempta Last Temptation of Christ, Jesus lives out this whole life and then decides to die to save people. And then Donnie chooses to die to save people. You know, I get the comparison. It's, it's an apt comparison. There are people who don't like this movie, and I understand why. <laughs> it's... It's a tad pretentious. Uh, pretentious it would be the opportune word, I guess. It's a tad pretentious. But I also think it's really funny. I don't think it gets enough credit for being a really funny movie. 
And I feel like I say that about a lot of movies. I feel like a lot of movies don't get credit for being really funny movies. And among them, Donnie Darko, a film with a, a really good sense of humor. I actually think it's really funny. And I... I get it. I get the story. I understand the story, more or less. It does seem a little full of itself. It does seem a little self-important. And... <laughs> I feel like what also kind of leaves a bad taste in people's mouths is that, you know, this came out and this got all this, like, critical acclaim, and then Richard Kelly, who directed this, went on and made Southland Tales, which... Woo! Oh, man, Southland Tales. <laughs> I kind of love it. I... It's bad. Let me be clear. Southland Tales is bad, but it's it's kind of hilariously bad. And and it's kind of odd, because I feel like there's obviously hilariously bad movies, like The Room or Birdemic, and then I think there's some hilariously bad movies where you kind of have to know what you're getting into. You kind of have to get why it's hilariously bad. And... Among those films, I feel Southland Tales is, you know, a film you have to be prepared for. It's not going to be something that's going to make everyone laugh. But it makes me laugh a whole lot, because it's fucking ridiculous. I, I would almost put it in the same ballpark, and this is maybe not the best comparison. I would almost put it in the same ballpark as Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas. Because it's a movie where it's like, I understand why you would find this boring or obnoxious, but I think it's hilarious. Other than that, there's no comparison between Kirk Cameron Saving Christmas and Southland Tales. But on that level, where it's like, I understand why people don't like this film, but I think it's hilarious. But the fact that Southland Tales was not very good makes people think... Maybe Donnie Darko was kind of a fluke, and he didn't actually know what he was doing? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt on that one, because I, I do think it's a good movie. I think it's an enjoyable movie. It's funny. It's well-made. Um, weird as shit. But, you know, it's... I like weird as shit movies. <laughs> the only one of these three movies to not get banned, at least in any First World nation. I mean, in, in, like, Saudi Arabia, I think, they banned every movie. So this is probably banned in, like, Saudi Arabia and probably also North Korea. North Korea probably banned this, but uh, it's not as widely banned as Evil Dead or Last Temptation of Christ. Uh, a lot of stars in this movie, too, a very star-studded cast. Jake Gyllenhaal's in the lead, and <laughs> I was trying to figure out who his sister was. I'm like, hold on, I recognize his sister. Who is that? And then I'm like, oh, it's fucking Maggie Gyllenhaal, his actual sister. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nice that he and his, si his sister plays his actual sister in this movie. Maggie Gyllenhaal doesn't get enough credit, doesn't get enough roles. I like Maggie Gyllenhaal. I mean, obviously Jake Gyllenhaal, amazing actor. He's, he's definitely gotten his dues for being a great actor. Maggie Gyllenhaal doesn't get enough credit. She's a great actress. She, she's the Joan Cusack of the Gyllenhaal family. Um, also, Drew Barrymore, who admittedly is not very good in this movie. <laughs> and... Maybe that's on purpose? Maybe that's part of a joke? But maybe it's not? And that's that's sort of one of those things where it's like, okay, there's a couple things in this film where I can't tell if he's joking or if it's just bad. And, and Drew Barrymore's performance is one of them. But she's a good actress. She's in good things, so I, I assume it's a joke. But she's not very good in this. Uh, who else? Seth Rogen has, like, a very small role. Very young Seth Rogen has a small role. Patrick Swayze is in this movie, which... A very late career Patrick Swayze, you know. 
Very early career Jake Gyllenhaal, early career uh, uh, Seth Rogen, very late career Patrick Swayze in this movie. Uh, he plays this like weird sort of culty guy. Um, from what I've read, it's supposed to be like a parody of Scientology because uh, Patrick Swayze was part of the Church of Scientology and then he left it before this movie was made. He, he was in the Church of Scientology in like the 80s and then he left. So he was in this movie doing sort of a parody of Scientology. Just a, a really weird film to see Patrick Swayze in, honestly. It is not something I expected him to be in. Because he's in so many of these, like, ham-fisted action movies in, like, the 80s. In the 80s, he was either in ham-fisted action or, like, some... He, he was, like, the hot boy in some romance film. And then fast forward to 2001, and here he is in this, like, surrealist horror thriller movie. Play, playing a pedophile cult leader. Yeah, definitely an interesting movie. I would recommend you check it out. If you don't like it, I get it, but I think you should at least check it out. And I don't want to shit on it too hard, because I really like it, and obviously there's a lot of people who really like it, so I, I feel like I'm the, in the majority saying that I do like this. I just understand where people who don't are coming from. Donnie Darko, definitely worth looking at, even if you ultimately don't like it. Speaking of Patrick Swayze, uh, last time I asked, what's a movie you associate with a holiday that has nothing to do with that holiday? And I, for one, watch Roadhouse every Christmas. I said that last time, but, you know, I watch Roadhouse every Christmas. It's, it's my Christmas tradition. I have a friend who, like, one of his friends watches Deep Throat every Christmas. And that's... That's an odd one to watch at Christmas. I'm trying to think, because I feel like there's another one that just, like, it doesn't quite fit the holiday, but I watch it that holiday anyways. Um, of course, I also watch Evil Dead and Donnie Darko for Easter. That's not really a tradition, it's just something I do. I actually wanted to do this triple feature last year, but it would have been, like, the second or third episode, and I'm like, I'm not doing that this early. So, I put it off till this year. Gregory House says, in Italy, they watch Trading Places for Christmas, which, hmm, that's an interesting one, but I mean, that... That sort of happens all over the world. There's just, like, weird stuff every country associates with Christmas that all the other countries are like, what What the fuck? Like, in Japan, they eat KFC for Christmas. Why? Yeah, that's interesting. I might have to watch Trading Places this Christmas. <laughs> uh, see, see how that plays at Christmas time. Um... Last Christmas I watched Burning Moon, and I might start watching that at Christmas. That's a really good movie. I mean, in America we watch The Ten Commandments at Easter, even though The Ten Commandments really has nothing to do with Easter. You know, like Ben-Hur I get. Ten Commandments... Not really. Maybe? Kinda? Cause like, it's also Passover. Easter comes at the end of Passover. But the Ten Commandments is not really about Passover either. That's interesting, I didn't know that. Thank you very much, Gregory. Also a bit of a late edition, Henry Koslick tells a story about um, going down to, to like his mom's friend's house for Fourth of July weekend every year, and the only film they had there that was child-friendly was Mouse Hunt. So Mouse Hunt was his uh, 4th of July movie. It's been a long time since I've seen Mouse Hunt. Like, I, I saw that when I was like 5 or 6, probably. 
All I, I, the only scene I remember is the scene where, like, they just fill an entire room with mouse traps. And then the mouse manages to set one off without killing itself, and it just sets off all of the other mouse traps in the room. That's all I remember from that movie. Tonight, I suppose my question is, what is your favorite rural horror movie? You know, a horror movie that wasn't shot in L.A. or in New York. Something that was made way in the backwoods of, you know, some Midwestern state. Because to counterbalance watching three movies I have seen, we're going to watch three movies I haven't seen. It's Arrow Video's American Horror Project Volume 2. You might remember, I guess less than a year ago, I did Volume 1. But I had seen one of the movies in Volume 1, um, because it was a video nasty. <laughs> what do you know? We're at like six video nasties now? Six? Because we did the triple feature, and then I showed Night of the Demons, and then I showed Witch Who Came From the Sea, and yeah, Evil Dead, number six. Six of the fucking video nasties. Good for us. I don't know how many more we'll watch. I know I have at least one coming up. Two or three weeks? Or two or three episodes, I should say. Two or three episodes? There's one coming up, at least, and I'll, I'll probably show at least two others. But I make no promises. Um, so we're gonna start this triple feature with... The Child. Um, followed by... Dark Argus? Dar Dark August. Woo! Try saying that one five times fast. Dark August. And finally, Dream No Evil. Um, the three movies in the American Horror Project Volume 2. And I think they're also on Tubi, because, like, all of Arrow Video's movies are on Tubi. So yeah, we're gonna watch those tonight and talk about them next time. Until then, my hair is too short. <laughs>